Good evening. Welcome to Thorn Hall and Occidental College. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your patience. We're gonna get started now. My name is Meldia Yassine. I'm the director of Oxy Arts and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third event in the inaugural year of our series Oxy Live, presented today by Occidental College, Oxy Arts, and LAist, LA's top NPR station. Before we go any further, I want to express my deep gratitude to Lisa Cosino, an Occidental trustee and alumna, <laughs> whose support and incredible commitment to the arts at Oxy has made this series possible. Thank you, Lisa. A special acknowledgement also goes to Occidental College President Harry Elam, whose vision and commitment to the arts has been instrumental to launch to the launch of this season. Thank you, President Elam. <laughs> the arts and literature offer us a unique perspective on truth, thought, and knowledge. They provide diverse viewpoints for observation, analysis, theorization, and understanding of this, our evolving human condition. In this room, I am sure that I am not alone in believing that the arts hold transformative power to change the world. Throughout history, during times of crises, as we are in now in many parts of the world, authoritarian regimes and even democratic governments have, have suppressed artists, banned performances, censored books, ideas, and creative expression. And yet, and yet, artists have persevered using their craft to advocate for justice and activism. And even despite these powerful contributions, the arts are sometimes dismissed as insubstantial or mere entertainment. This series challenges that perspective, positioning art at the forefront of debates about our future. Occidental College is situated in the center of Los Angeles in a city that many now consider the creative capital of the world. In this ideal setting, we are so pleased to welcome all of the artists and cultural luminaries to the stage for this engagement. The college's commitment to critical inquiry and social justice aligns seamlessly with the series mission. Tonight's event follows our first two incredible events in the series, with Alok Manan in October here at Thorne and Ruha Benjamin last week at the Ford Foundation in New York. Coming up in the spring, please join us with Julie Meretu in February and Lori Anderson in April. I know. And now let me introduce tonight's host and our special guest. Paul Holdengraber is a cultural interlocutor and a curator of public curiosity. He was most recently the founding executive director of Onassis Los Angeles Previously and for 14 years, he was founder and director of the New York Public Library's Live from the NYPL cultural series, where he interviewed and hosted over 600 events, holding conversations with everyone from Patti Smith to Zadie Smith, Ricky Jay to Jay-Z, Errol Morris to Jan Morris, Wes Anderson to Helen Marin, Werner Herzog to Mike Tyson and more and more. Before his tenure at the library, Holden Graber was the founder and director of the Institute for Arts and Cultures at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and a fellow at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. He holds a PhD in comparative literature from Princeton and has taught at Princeton, Williams College, and the Claremont Graduate University. In 2003, the French government named Holden Graber Chevalier of Arts and Letters and then promoted him in 2012 to the rank of Commandeur of the Arts and Letters. In 2010, the president of Austria awarded him the Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and Art. Our esteemed guest this evening is Rebecca Solnit. <laughs> Although her reputation precedes her, I will provide a brief summary. Writer, historian, and activist Solnit is the author of 25 books on feminism, environmental and urban history, popular power, social change, and insurrection, Wandering and Walking, my favorite, Hope and Catastrophe. She co-edited the 2023 climate anthology, Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. Her other books include Orwell's Roses, Recollections of My Non-Existence, Hope in the Dark, Men Explain Things to Me, A Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities, The Rise and Disaster, and A Field Guide to Getting Lost. 
a product of the California public education system from kindergarten through graduate school. She writes regularly for The Guardian, serves on the board of the Climate Group, Oil Change International, and in 2022, launched the climate project Not Too Late. I quote now from her book, Hope in the Dark. Pay attention to the inventive arenas that exert political power outside the stage or change the contents of the drama on stage. From the places that you have been instructed to ignore or rendered unable to see come the stories that change the world. And it is here that culture has the power to shape politics and ordinary people have the power to change the world. I present to you tonight, Paul Holdengraber and Rebecca Solnit. Wow. I would say this is a, a warm welcome. What I do you think? So far, we agree completely. Let's hear it again for Rebecca. <laughs> joy to be here with you. And we'll be speaking about joy. Um, I'm, first of all, in need of thanking uh, Mildia for all the extraordinary work she's done on this series. Lisa Cosino for helping so much underwriting this series. Thank you so much. And the president of Occidental, Harry Ellum, for believing that this series was not only urgent, necessary, but we had to do it. And here we are. So, Interestingly enough, these two books, not too late, changing the climate story from despair to possibility, and hope in the dark, untold histories, wild possibilities. For me, Rebecca, they form a diptych. You know, I. I keep agreeing with you, but, uh, well, I, but we'll of course change what's that. really different is that not too, when Hope in the Dark, I wrote myself, Not Too Late is a global book with people from Fiji, the Philippines, the Marshall Islands, um, Pakistan, different parts of the U.S. and North America, and really to try, because the climate story is such a big story and there's no one topic, form of expertise, et cetera, that can bring it in. And Thelma, my co-editor, who's based in Fiji and married to an indigenous Fijian, and I felt we needed this chorus to convey both the complexity of what's happening and the vibrancy of the people who are doing uh, the things that matter in this moment. But the diptych for me also has to do with one word the titles share, which is the word possibility. Yeah, people, I often get people treating hope like it's this far-fetched, wild, unreasonable thing that, you know, sophisticated people don't have, and it's like, look, you stand at the bus stop hoping the bus will come. You know, hope is not so far removed from our everyday lives. But also, what is hope? It's a recognition that, of the radical uncertainty of the future, and that within that are some possibilities we can seize if we act. I'm not an optimist at all, and I think optimism, like pessimism, is, a sense that the future has already been decided and requires nothing of us, whereas with climate, with everything, we are deciding the future and what we do, how we do it, um, or what we fail to do, and uh, the future is what something that's being made in the present all the time. So possibility in both books is about an invitation to people to seize that possibility and run with it and make something of it. And it's interesting because there is a real sense of despair I've ran into Hope in the Dark was in part a response to 
anti-war people when the war in Iraq broke out um, 20 years ago this March. It was true we had not stopped the war. We had delayed it. We had changed its shape. Some countries didn't join up or pulled out. I think people in Iraq had more time to prepare. Um, you know, well, we, but we had not stopped the war. And they went from the truth, the truth or the fact that we did not stop the war to say something that wasn't true, we didn't do anything, to then this kind of tailspin of we have no power, we never win, it's all useless. And emotionally, I can understand that. But analytically, it's not true. I think of hope now as really pretty factual. We don't know what will happen. It's smarter to assume you don't know than pretend you do. And it's smart also, since we can't see the future, to learn from the past and see if you look at time in bigger increments, you learn a lot about the nature of change and the nature of power. The short term gives you these very kind of miserable top-down versions, but the long term gives you something else altogether. I was actually listening on the radio in San Francisco this morning about 15 years ago when California voted on marriage equality, voted the wrong way, but the much better than now, Supreme Court overturned it and gave, you know, but there's a way you, the short term story is the Supreme Court gave us marriage equality, which is a, a top down story of uh, more power exists at the center. But the real story is queer people coming out of the closet to their family, their friends, their coworkers, their fellow students, creating conversations, opening up space, um, changing the collective imagination over a period of decades and then with activism around marriage and, uh, you know, and the rights that accrue. Um, that's where the change really happened. The Supreme Court just ratified it. So the short-term story is power from the top. The long-term story is power from the margins, the grassroots, and the bottom. So I feel that hope is actually very realistic if you understand change and power, but in order to do those, you have to have a deep sense of the past. And I know you're not American by origin. We here are in a very amnesiac country where people don't <laughs> often remember both how different the world is than it was 10 and 20 and 50 years ago and how it got that way when it comes to the good things. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I'd like to um, challenge your own description yeah. of yourself. Oh, OK. Um, when, when you said, you know, I'm not an optimist, um, yeah. I wonder if Noam Chomsky might help us here. Um, Chomsky has this to say about optimism, and I'm wondering if it might go, it might convince you that to some extent Rebecca Solnit is an optimist. Let's see. I'm willing to try. Optimism is a strategy for making a better future. Because unless you believe that the future can be better, you are unlikely to step up and take responsibility for making it so. I agree with that. I'd also call it hopeful uh, rather than optimistic. What I do see is people, for me, optimism is are the people who say everything's going to be fine, subtext, nothing is required of us. And they're very much like the pessimists and the cynics who say everything is going to the dogs and there's nothing we can do about it. And I think for affluent people in safe and comfortable circumstances, that essentially gets us off the hook. And what's striking, and this is again why we wanted Global Voices, is People on the front lines are not defeatist, they're not in despair, um, because giving up for them has very real and terrible consequences, so the hell they're going to give up. Whereas I see a lot of us in the much safer, more affluent global north as, as not only giving up, but not pretending it's some form of solidarity with their doom, but we're really consigning them to their doom by saying we're not going to do anything about it, or at least we're not doing anything to um, you know, stave off that doom. And so I see a lot of despair among the relatively safe people and a lot of ferocious resistance among people who are most impacted and people were, 
where it's like you will never escape the gulag or the refugee camp where you're just going to let your children die. Do not say, oh, there's nothing we can do. So there is a kind of glibness, I think, on both sides that assumes we know what's going to happen that requires nothing of us. And that's why I'm kind of the enemy of that form of optimism and pessimism. Whereas hope for me is just that there may be possibilities and those possibilities saddle us with the responsibility of trying to seize them, to make them happen, to participate in steering towards the best case scenario and away from the worst case scenario, which is absolutely urgent. We are making decisions in this decade about the future of the planet, not only for our species, but for all species for the next several thousand years by what we do or don't do about the transition away from fossil fuels and other things producing runaway climate change. We now know exactly what we need to do. We have the technology to do it. The obstacles are only political, but we need to build a climate movement more powerful than the fossil fuel industry and the financial uh, corporate and state interest so backing So there are reasons actually to be hopeful. There are also, and something I also find about a lot of despair with climate lately, what's been fascinating is it's not only people having misinformation that it is, you know, but they're having outdated information. And it's misinformation to say that it's too late. The climate scientists don't say that. But I hear that nobody cares. The climate movement hasn't done anything. We don't have the solutions. The media is not covering this. A lot of those things would have been true 10 years ago. They're extremely not true now. The, you know, the LA Times just started a whole climate section with Sammy Roth and leadership doing great work. Um, all the major papers have uh, pretty good, like I don't agree with how they do it, but they're doing it. And most people care, most people support climate action. It's not the public that's the obstacle, despite that silly movie, Don't Look Up. It's an entrenched minority, often with the uh, vested interests, especially the fossil fuel industry. So it's interesting, an outdated story is an untrue story as much as a story that was never true. And there is, and what's fascinating is that 20 years ago, we did not really have an alternative to fossil fuel to run this world. Wind and sun were primitive, expensive, utterly inadequate technologies. Battery storage was also just very, you know, primitive and inadequate. We have had an energy revolution, but again, I'm, I said to somebody the other day, my superpower is slowness. Yeah, again, if you look at, you know, if Your you, superpower is slowness. Slowness, yeah. yeah. That if you mostly, a lot of stories get told in what happened this week, what happened this month, what happened this year. But we've had an energy revolution, but it's been over a couple of decades. And so it's invisible to people that wind and sun, solar is now the cheapest form of energy, of electricity we've ever seen. Wind is often better than that. Um, it's being implemented almost at a rate to meet the demands of sticking to 1.5. So, so I think 20 years ago, we didn't have solutions. Solar, we, you know, solar and wind were inadequate. The public was not engaged. All that has changed. But you have to be both paying attention to see that um, where we are now, and you have to be paying attention to the long-term long picture to see that it's all changed in this time. So, so what you're saying is time is on your, on, your, on your side. I think the Rolling Stones sang that too, <laughs> and, um, um, but I can't sing. And so, I, and but I time, don't know. Climate, but I, time isn't, it's urgent, but understanding, you cannot understand the world in short-term increments. I, one thing people started saying to me after Roe versus Wade was overturned on my birthday last year, I took it personally, um, <laughs> was that, oh, feminism is rolling, is going back. And it's like, do you have any idea what the status of women was 60 years ago? It was so abysmal when it been both rights and culture, concepts like marital rape and domestic violence, you know, um, and workplace harassment didn't even exist. Inequality was completely normal uh, by law and by custom in marriage, in the workplace, in education, in law, in, um, every, in economics, in everything. But also then if you broaden the picture to look at what's been happening with reproductive rights, women in Argentina, Mexico, Ireland, and a number of other countries have actually gained 
the right to abortion while well, we've temporarily lost them in the US, but I think it's six states, I'm looking at my democratic um, activist friends here, have actually voted constitutional rights that are better than Roe versus Wade, state constitutional rights. So it's like you pull, I always think in a sense, it's like the close up disorients you, to use, we're in LA, cinematic terminology. It's the sort of the zoom, the establishing shot, you know, or just watching something over time, you understand it better. So that's part of why I'm a passionate advocate of slowness, which partly means um, overcoming short attention spans, quick fixes, um, last night's news as your only source of information. You know, I, I, I only think of this wonderful uh, quotation in Walter Benjamin where he says, he's quoting Paul Valéry, so it's Benjamin quoting Valéry, says, man no longer works at what cannot be abbreviated. Wow. Yeah, no, and it's interesting looking at how people... That was 1920. <laughs> and it got worse. It did. Uh, you see, so... The, yeah. yeah. There's a theologian I might have quoted in both Oh, it's works. wonderful. Walter Brueggemann. I Th think that's I one of my very, very favorite. Yeah. Let me read it um, so that you, 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 you get the exact words. They're so beautiful. Let me find it. Maybe you know the exact words. It's pretty close to memory Let, breeds hope as, a, as amnesia breeds despair. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I passed my pop quiz. It's, uh, and I, I really think deep time, because also like, you know, the world has, I, I'm, 60, I'm, I'm the same age as the Berlin Wall, and I might add doing much better. And, um, <laughs> you know, the world I was born into no longer exists, and how dramatically different it was from the world we're in now, how normal colonialism, racism, homophobia, uh, it's, um, rigid roles um, for genders, and also a kind of authoritarianism in everyday life that allowed corporal punishment in the schools, looked the other way on domestic violence and child abuse. Um, uh, all forms of authoritarianism were so much more accepted, and which is of course a form of inequality at, um, you know, the civil rights movement was doing its work, but so much the feminist movement hadn't begun yet. And you look at these things, and just to understand how radically different the world is, is, you know, in this, in the last 50 or 60 years is breathtaking. And one of the things, one of the pieces of equipment for my hope right now is, I know what we need to do to make a livable world in 2073, but I don't know what 2073 will be like at all. I've been asked a few times, like, we need to know. And my answer is, nobody in 1973 could picture 2023. We are living in a world utterly inconceivable in every way, the technology, the most wonderful and the most terrible changes, the profound social changes. Um, but so many of the best things we have now are because there were women's movements, disability rights movements, uh, gay rights movements, which became bro broader queer rights movements. Uh, you know, this, the black civil rights movement was said to be winding down, but the Chicano movement, um, the farm workers movement, uh, uh, the Native American rights movements and stuff were really just gathering momentum in 1973. We can see the, you know, the harvest of the seeds they planted. So I just want to be somebody who in 2073, somebody says, these good things we have are because people in 2023, without knowing how we would get there, nevertheless did what they could to get us here, laid the groundwork for the energy transition, laid the groundwork for this expansion of human rights, laid the groundwork for these environmental protections and awarenesses. So, and what's exciting, let me just add, I don't expect to be here in 2073. I, I will actually I was, be 112. And, well, um, you know, I like, you never know. You but, never know. But a bunch of you will be here in 2073, and maybe and, you'll be in 2023. Here's what we thought the world is possible or impossible. Welcome to the impossible world. To your grandchildren or the kids you're hanging out with, or teaching, or doctoring, or whatever the hell you're doing. So all you young people, like. 
Start planning your 2073. And um, I, I, I might add that not too late is particularly written with young people in mind. You have a, a fabulous first footnote uh, where you explain what the word we means. Do you want me to read it? Why not? Read the first since, page. Since we yeah. have the... We have it the book. It was really fun. And this is something I was talking about Re with my read friends Read this earlier. and read the footnote if you okay. could. Okay. Okay. It, um, Do you need it is late. We are deep in an emergency, but it is not too late because the emergency is not over. The outcome is not decided. We are deciding it now. The longer we wait to act, the more limited the options, but scientists tell us there are good options and great urgency to embrace them while we can. An emergency is when a Stable situation destabilizes when the house catches fire or the dam breaks or institution implodes, when the failure or sudden change or crisis calls for an urgent response. It's when it becomes clear that the way things were is not how they're going to be. And then let's see if I can do this tiny, no, tiny thing. But I do have reading glasses. On um, the footnote, the, says the word we is both problematic and necessary so at the, at the outset, I want to acknowledge that not everyone is part of any version of we. This book was put together with young people and newcomers to the climate movement in mind, with an expectation that most readers would be in the US and global north. Even there, the differences matter between indigenous and settler, rich and poor, people who have lost homes and lives to the climate crisis and those who think of it as largely in the future. But there's also the we that is all humanity, all who are impacted and all beings alive now and yet to come. So take this we with a grain of salt and allow some latitude for the necessity in an, in, uh, let me do that again, because this one counts. So take this we with a grain of salt and allow some latitude for the necessity and inadequacy of the categories that make up language. And that's something I think about all the time. We have to talk in categories, Jew, Christian, Muslim, male, female, black, white, young, old. But I always say categories are leaky and we have to hold them loosely. We have to use them while recognizing they will not always describe the world adequately. We often need better language, subtler language, footnotes and qualifiers, a recognition that Every word, you, you know, horse is a category, water is a category. Sometimes water is hard and you can walk across it, although not in LA. But, um, you know, sometimes water is a blessing, sometimes it's the dam breaking or the flood or, you know. Um, so having that kind of imaginative resilience to understand we will speak in categories because language is categories and that the categories will always be imperfect and incomplete descriptions and we can't get too invested in them. Often people use categories as we have to stop thinking we're the good people and they're the bad people. And categories also, yeah. putting people in a category no, is gauges also. gauges yeah. too often. Yeah, and stories can do that as well. I'm always interested in how do you break the story it, that it's too late as a prison, that nobody cares, that we, that we don't know what to do, that we don't have the solutions. Our cages people are putting themselves in that are stopping us from doing what we need with So climate. we need to tell a different kind of story. Yeah. And, and um, you know, in, in thinking about this, I, I, I was reminded, we spoke many years ago on a, on a series I had uh, beautifully entitled A Phone Call from Paul. And, um, <clears throat> and I remember speaking with Salman Rushdie, and this is what he had to say about stories in that, in that conversation. He said, stories are the things that, we tell us, that tell us who we are. We are narrative animals. We're an animal that understands itself by stories by telling stories. Children want stories very early as a way of understanding the world. And all of us, we live in stories. Family have, families have family stories. Cities have stories of the city. Community, secular or religious, have stories which define them. Countries 
have national stories. And we live, and I love this, we live in these concentric circles of stories and we understand ourselves through them. Stories contain in the most beautiful way what we have been, the potential of what we could be, speculations of what, of what we might be. They are the memory of the human race. And it's one of the beautiful things about being in the world, trying to make stories which become, if we're lucky, part of a collective memory. I'm wondering how you react to that. It's beautiful, but I feel like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I dissent in that um, stories are magic carpets, they're wings, but they're also cages and prisons and punishments. And I grew up personally with a mother who told herself stories that made her miserable and angry. And you see that all the time. People tell stories um, that they're fragile, that they're weak, that they have no power to change. Um, they, they tell, you know, we tell stories in which some people are inferior to other people. Joan Didion famously wrote, we tell stories in order, in order to, to live. live. I revised that in the opening of my, of my book, The Far Way Nearby, a decade ago. We tell stories in order to live or to justify the failure to live or taking life, etc. I, you know, when wars are fought, people tell stories that justify killing. Um, every guy hauled in for domestic violence is going to tell a story justifying what he did if he's not also denying it but, at the same but time. But you want to... So I think, yeah. so I, I, in journalism, we have a wonderful phrase, break the story, which means to get the story nobody's First, gotten, yeah. to, to break, you know, to break, to bring it into the world, um, to break it open. But I also love that phrase because I think a lot of stories need to be broken. The story that because of your race, your gender, your class, your yeah. um, disability, yeah. your orientation, you're inferior is a story that was the world I was born into that was all pervasive and almost nobody was breaking it. That is a story that needed, that's many stories that needed to be breaking, to be broken. Sorry, my tense freaked. Uh, you know, there are a lot of stories we need to break and as happening, I think, by changing the statues of who, uh, and names of who and what we commemorate by how we think about nature, by how we think, I think we're radically egalitarian compared to where we were 60 years ago, where you know, some of us are. We have a right-wing backlash that wants to re, um, resurrect all the old hierarchies. So I think stories can be terribly poisonous. That you know, The infidels must die stories are everywhere. And um, you know, I, the, What I was alluding to um, yeah. also was the notion that for instance, in Not Too Late, you want to tell a different kind of yeah, story, no, it, uh, yeah. which is, I think, incredibly important, is that stories of doom and gloom, and, you know, people yeah, who drink see, Drano are... in the morning, you know, yes. you know people who are um, acidulated and acerbic and cynical and sarcastic, it doesn't necessarily do us all that much good. Exactly. Yeah. No, I wanted to bring in all these voices of people who are deeply committed and deeply engaged, deeply informed from really different positions. Um, you know, there's frontline people. We've got three major climate scientists. Our youngest contributors in her mid-20s. Our oldest is the Buddhist leader and anthropologist, Roshi Joan Halifax. And, um, but really to try and give people, and you know, these stories um, of what we can do, what we must do, and to kind of give people that backward glance, I compiled myself what's called an, incom an extremely an incomplete. incomplete list of climate victories. Uh, it's about eight pages long, very tightly spaced, um, single spaced, because also people don't remember. We defeated the KXL pipeline. We have stopped a lot of pipelines. We've, we've, the Beyond Coal campaign has shut down or prevented from opening or led to the phase out of more than 500 coal burning plants, which has radically changed the energy profile of this country and also saved a lot of people from dying because when you burn coal, particulate matter, including a bunch of heavy metals, goes into the atmosphere and people and animals 
uh, breathe them, they fall into the soil. I, eventually, we're going to start, we're starting to tell a story that fossil fuel is poison. We're beginning to recognize that pumping methane into your house where it might explode or it might just be poisonous all the time and give your kids asthma and sort of diminish everyone's health is kind of crazy. And so we're changing, but in order to change the world, you have to change the story. And, and the, the quotation you had earlier about amnesia is precisely yeah. that, when we, you yeah. know, that we don't remember. I, um, even after all these years of living in this country, I still can't get used to this phrase. Um, when you want to talk about something that is irrelevant, you say that's history, <laughs> which is one of the, I mean, untranslatable in any other language I know. I mean, you, you couldn't yeah. say in France, c'est de l'histoire. They would say, histoire de quoi? You know, they would want to know, yeah. is it the history of the French kings or is it the history yeah. of agriculture? But when you Or want... they'd say, we are the children of that history. Oh, we... Yeah. Perhaps, yes. Yeah, no, the present is made out of the past. The future will be made out of the present. So the history, as in Henry Ford's history is bunk, is such a weird dismissive idea. What's that famous William Faulkner quote? The past is not over, it's not even past. I got it slightly wrong. It's, but. it's close enough. There, <laughs> there is, um, it's today in 1757, um, William Blake was born. And there's a line of his that I love, that I feel is pungent with meaning and may may find fertile ground when I say it in your mind. He said, what is now proved was once only imagined. That is such a beautiful, simple, and true sentence. And, and it's also about, and I think this is perfect for a university, the power of imagination. You have to imagine something, desire it, and then make it real, and remember that very real things. Women's right to vote was a wild, wild idea that took 80 years to realize. And there actually are people like the um, billionaire fascist Peter Thiel who suggested it should be rolled back, but I don't think it, he's a, he's a minority. And, um, but yeah, but, and it's interesting, and there's, it, Gandhi is not the person who said First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. But ideas have this migration. And in a sense, I said to a bi biologist that I'm a biologist of migratory patterns, only of ideas. I, what I find most exciting is seeing how an idea, marriage equality as an example, um, goes from being something people don't think about, people think is outlandish or impossible or extreme, to ultimately it becomes reality. Marriage equality in a large part of the world is just the law of the land and people are, lots of same-sex couples are married because of it. It's, you know, so it all begins in imagination. And a lot of what made me hopeful was, see, was first seeing that culture makes politics. I was around mm. an indigenous mm. rights struggle in the early 1990s, the Western Shoshone land rights struggle, the US government forgot to steal their land in the 19th century. And so in the late 20th century, had to pretend that it already had by telling a completely false story. But, um, but I was involved in that struggle and writing about stuff. And I saw the story. And we white settler colonialists were telling a story for a very long time. Native people had disappeared, and were on the one hand a story where Native people had somehow conveniently disappeared. The Indian Wars had happened in the 19th century, and now we didn't think they were good things, but it was all over, so nothing need be done in the present. That really was a kind of representational genocide that made Native people invisible. And on the other hand, environmentalists and nature lovers and stuff were constantly talking about virgin wilderness and discovery and being the first man ever to set foot on this mountain or this place and stuff like that. And I saw Native people, particularly in reaction against the story of Columbus discovering America that was supposed to be celebrated on its 500th anniversary of 1992, break the story, break the story of discovery, break the story of disappearance, 
make visible the story of genocide and survival and resistance. And, you know, we didn't do land acknowledgments here. I now realizing, but most things I do now include land acknowledgments, I'll, partly because of this conversation, a lot of native uh, nations have regained rights, land, um, resources, um, revived languages and customs and culture. Um, the US census shows a lot more native people in 2000 than in 1990 and each subsequent decade more and more because people are claiming ancestry they felt either ashamed of or fearful of representing is, is part of it. So like I saw, I saw the world get changed and I saw it began with historians and cultural activist people on reservations, elders who remembered the languages and the stories and it became practical reality. You know, culture, I think of culture as like the deep soil and politics is this kind of very, this top layer that matters tremendously but culture matters in those ways, and changing representations ultimately changes realities. And the words we use. Um, Mildia was mentioning that we were in, in New York last week, yeah. um, speaking with, with Rua Benjamin at, at the Ford Foundation as part of this whole series, so we, we truly are a, a movable feast, as it were. And during, during uh, the conversation, I quoted to uh, Rua, something that I will now quote to you that comes from Audre Lorde, where she says, without community, there is no liberation. Again, like Blake, incredibly short. And this gives me the occasion for you to talk a little bit, perhaps also in response to, to Audre Lorde, of this group you were part of. Um, it has a wonderful acronym, ASS. Um, if, you, if, you could, um, if you could talk about, about your friends yeah. and, and who With they pleasure. are and what they did and what community they, they belong yeah. to. I think one of the most, you know, we have a loneliness epidemic, as the Surgeon General of the United States says, and I think a lot of things, and the pandemic didn't help, but I think the technology Silicon Valley has given us and their agenda has really helped create a lot of isolation, which helps create mental health problems, alienation, isolation, susceptibility to online conspiracy theories like QAnon, et cetera. And so what is the, what is the an antidote to that? And it is community. We don't get liberated alone. We want we get, we, I totally agree with it. And um, so I also am interested in like, what do we do that connects us versus what disconnects us? And the terrifying thing, and I live in San Francisco, I've been there since before Silicon Valley was really the global force it is now. And what I find alarming as I bicycle among driverless cars uh, is that the rhetoric of Silicon Valley has always been human contact is unpleasant, inefficient, and threatening, which it probably is to them, which doesn't say much for them. Um, um, here's our exciting new technology to further eliminate it from your life. And you know, and like those conversations you had with the bank clerk or the supermarket checker or the toll taker or whatever, you know, our lives are knit together into a sense of belonging by living in public living. I think democracy is predicated in part on a certain kind of trust in strangers and people unlike you that partly comes just from having contact with them, the more you withdraw into your fortress, and I think this is why suburban whiteness um, is so susceptible to somebody like Trump and the white supremacy he's peddling. So the antithesis is connecting, and I think connecting across difference in particular, but the anti-selling squad, which is what ASS starts, stands for, was founded by Christina Wong. <laughs> This, and what, do we have other aunties in the house? Ooh, we've got a bunch of them in the back. So my friend Valerie So, who I've been friends with since 1988, I think, just told me this cool thing was happening, organized on Facebook. Essentially, Christina, at the beginning of the pandemic, realized we had that huge mask shortage. She offered on, on social media to make a cloth mask for anybody who needed 
one uh, got deluged, I should say, Christina's uh, performance artist based in Koreatown here. And so she started recruiting and ultimately uh, the Auntie Sewing Squad became a group of 800 sewists making cloth masks beautifully, often out of beautiful fabrics um, for the most vulnerable, most threatened, most marginalized communities during those early months, several, what was it, 16 months of the pandemic. Um, in that period, they made a third of a million masks um, and did more than that, brought together. We became an online community. I built real friendships, a number of real friendships through it. Through it. I brought people in who created further connections. We created a relationship thanks to um, one of our core aunties, Badly Licked Bear, with the, <laughs> with the standing, with, with, oh, oh my God, you're there, Badly. And, um, with the Navajo Nation, another auntie, Auntie Constance, um, is she here? At, um, built a relationship with Standing Rock. Uh, we delivered, was it 12 sewing machines? Like the, the, the Navajo Nation didn't need us to make masks for them. They just needed fabrics, threads, elastic, and sewing machines. So we supplied those and hand washing stations and all those things. And my official title was the, um, writer, historian, shakedown auntie, because I turned out to be good at raising money. Um, ultimately, Constance, with a young medic at Standing Rock, um, spun off into another project, which ultimately brought two ambulances, um, 6,000 pounds of medical equipment and supplies, et cetera, to Standing Rock, which is this huge reservation where people were dying because they couldn't get medical care in time, partly because they didn't have ambulances. So I like to say Christina Wong sat down to make a mask on her Hello Kitty sewing machine and made a community, two ambulances, 12 sewing machines, sort of nation to nation relationships with a bunch of native nations. It was truly remarkable. And it was the pandemic isolated us in so many ways. And the anti-sewing squad was the most beautiful example of mutual aid reaching out to support people who needed it, but also taking care of each other. Often there's a sense on the left that like we must take care of other people, but not ourselves. Or there was a thing called anti-care where aunties um, gave each other cookies and sweets and gifts and support. And when it was safer to get together, we got together and hung out. So it was this really remarkable thing that was the antithesis of the kind of fear and hate and loneliness of the pandemic, and I think it did a lot of practical good because even while people were debating masks, the squad was sending masks out, and the science is good. Masks, you know, obviously, you know, if you sneeze, um, you know, it's a little different if a mask is over your face for what goes out into the atmosphere. So um, it was just remarkable to see and to see the organic way it related. And I should also say, Christina then made a performance, which I think played here, or and um, called uh, Christina Wong, Sweatshop Overlord. <laughs> and that, and also, which was a finalist, and she became a finalist for the Pulitzer in Drama and won all these other awards. It's been a remarkable ride to go along. Uh, it's been great. And I, let me just add, and because the squad, one of the lovely things that happened, there's a Southeast Asian um, Buddhist monastery in the Bay Area, because there's also fabric shortages, so they donated all these robes. One of the things happening, you may not know this event, is a, a monk robe fabric distribution between the aunties here. We're trying to get rid of the end of it, so <laughs> So if you, if you need to make something out of, you know, sacred saffron colored fabric, um, see the overlord in the second row. You know, what, um, what, what, what you're saying here um, brings to mind a wonderful um, thought of someone I, I dearly loved but got only to know a little bit, unfortunately too late, Barry Lopez. Barry Lopez had this to say about conversation. He said, conversations are efforts towards good relations, an elementary form of reciprocity. They are the exercise of our love for each other. They are the enemies of our loneliness, our doubt, our anxiety, our tendency to abdicate. 
And I think that that's what happens when we talk to each other as we do here. It is a way of saying, here we are. We're in this together. We're doing work together. Um, we're advancing something. Um, you know, there's so many essays in this book that I, I wanted to, to talk about, but this one I, I love by Roshi Joan Halifax. And this is how it begins. Some time ago, I read these words from climate activist and storyteller Terry Tempest Williams and thought this one brave and upright and, and thought that this is one brave and upright woman. Williams wrote, a good friend said to me, you are married to sorrow. And Williams replied, I'm not married to sorrow. I choose not to look away. That to me captures something fundamental. We must not avert our eyes. And I actually think that it's not the most sorrowful way to live, that it's when sorrow is chasing you and you're running from it that you're really its slave. You're kind of a slave to your own fear of it. And, you know, it's... Um, and, but you don't really escape it. It's by facing things. And I found as an anti-nuclear activist there are people in the 80s, um, before, before climate change became apparent, people really thought that Ronald Reagan and company were going to start the all-out nuclear war. And there were people so afraid of it, they kept trying to pretend it wasn't an issue. But I found that being an anti-nuclear activist um, was actually a great, but facing it, feeling that you could do something about it, and the same with climate, that facing something, connecting to other people who care, finding your agency to do something about it, not letting fear overwhelm you, is a much better way to do that. And of course, Terry is an a, a climate activist who's done some really extraordinary things. And she's also married to an extraordinarily nice man who is probably the opposite of sorrow. And um, so it's funny because I helps. never, yeah, I, uh, Brooke Adams, I, I'm Brooke, Brooke Williams. I'd never thought of that literally. Who is Terry married to? Definitely not sorrow. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, but, you know, and there is this idea that you can look away from things somehow, and they don't go away if you look away from them. You know, if there is a dragon in the room, you might want to keep an eye on it. And if you can do something about the dragon, all the better, but turning your back on it is not going to make it go away if it's a real dragon. And, um, so one of the, the stories you want to tell uh, that I think you've told again and again and again is the uh, importance of both humor and joy and how actually they are tools for, for they are necessary tools for activism. We need them, I mean, you know, the last lines of, of uh, the first chapter in, in Hope in the Dark says it beautifully, but rather than reading it, I'd like you to explore this notion of an, the agitation that joy produces in the world and what the lack of it really removes from the world. First, I would say, if you meet somebody who has no sense of humor, um, run. <laughs> This is different than my dragon advice, evidently, but, but you know, that people who have no sense of humor, you, I think of humor as like a kind of binocular vision. You're seeing the gap between the way things are supposed to be and the way they actually are. And there's a kind of fanaticism that refuses to see that, that becomes very confining to the person doing it and anybody around them who get, they try to tell what is possible. But I think joy, is a revolutionary force. There's a, you know, so much of the oppression is joylessness trying to spread itself. And there's, but there's also a strong sense on the left that we can't have nice things till after the revolution and the, revo the revolution that's in eternally postponed. First of all, what I've been telling you 
is that the revolution's been happening continuously, at least through my lifetime, and, and as a cultural revolution. But also, I think joy is immediacy, uh, presentness. Um, and there's a wonderful passage I quoted in my book, Orwell's Roses, um, the photographer, oh gosh, I'm going blank on her name now, Zoe, um, Zoe Leonard is talking to the David Wanarovich, the AIDS activist, and she's feeling guilty because they're having the AIDS crisis, but she's making beautiful photographs of clouds. And thank you, people who know you, who can like fill in the blanks here. And he says, and he says, but don't you know that's what we're fighting for? If we don't do beauty now, we'll forget what we're fighting for. And you can't wait till it's all over for beauty, pleasure, and joy. I did an event with one of the writers in this book, the remarkable Julian Aguan, indigenous to the island of Guam, also a lawyer who just won a huge climate victory, started by college students at the law school in Vanuatu. And how many of you have heard of Vanuatu? Um, yeah, so people, it'd be very easy when you're on a tiny island that might go underwater that most people on Earth haven't heard of to feel powerless, but they didn't. They brought a motion to the United Nations through the Blue, uh, Blue Water Law Firm, um, Julian spearheaded, and it passed unanimously. Uh, but, um, but I digress, which is all I've ever done. But I did, this, I did this event with Julian, and we were talking about very serious things, and he's in a frontline community. And before the event, he murmured in my ear, make sure we talk about beauty, joy, and abundance. And I think those things, you know, it's what fascism wants to crush, it's what racism wants to crush, it's what homophobia wants to crush. And there's a kind of joylessness of, of oppression and authoritarianism, of hate. And joy is maybe something we want for everybody. It's the roses in Bread and Roses, but you can't wait. Any chance you get, seize it. And it doesn't stop you, because there's often this sense that we don't actually need roses, we only need bread. We can, you know, just sort of diligently toil on. But joyless activists, joyless companions, and joy, joy and joylessness are both contagious. And I think we actually need it. And so the bread and roses thing is because also in Orwell's Roses, I'd been hearing the phrase bread and roses all my life, but I hadn't fully understood. It was this radical demand by suffragists and labor organizers uh, 110 years ago that we fight for bread but roses too, insisting that working class people, uh, voiceless people, they needed bread, the practical things of life, food, clothing, shelter, living wages, e access um, to, but they also needed roses by which they meant they, we needed beauty, art, culture, nature, leisure, and that these things we need are subjective, they're pleasurable, and they're not gonna be the same for everyone. An authoritarian regime can, give everyone bread and maybe circuses, but it can't give them the roses because the roses have to be kind of freely chosen um, as a beauty, joy, and abundance. And I'm seeing the activist world and the climate world point more towards the possibility of abundance if we carry through with our dreams, become plans, become realities. So I think joy matters. And I think- It, it matters also to make a movement such yeah. as climate activism yeah. appealing in, in, in yeah. some way to take the joy out of fighting for something, to take the beauty out of something like um, fighting for the climate makes us into austere, uh, joyless... Protestants. Protestant. <laughs> It's such, a, such no, an no, idea no. that through renunciation, no. God will reward. God no. will reward the virtue you know, of renunciation. Sort of is, you know, yeah. I, I think of, of, of yeah. No, Sorry. I, yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> Gilles Deleuze, a French philosopher, yeah. said this beautiful uh, had this beautiful comment where he said, "The system wants us to be sad, and we have to be. We have to come." to be happy to resist it. Which, Absolutely. Which, is, which to my mind is, let's not let them take that away from us. I think it sustains people too. And what shocked me when I actually met the Roses, 
that may well have been planted by George Orwell was, I'd known for most of my adult life, but I hadn't thought hard enough, what did it mean that the great mid-century anti-fascist devoted a good deal of his time to gardening, to flowers, to pleasure. And I think he understood something that serves us all really well, that in order to look at totalitarianism, to look at Stalinism, to look at the gulag and the concentration camp, the death camp, he also had to look at something beautiful that he had to replenish himself to come back and face the difficult things. And you will often find people who are like, oh, you're a trivial, shallow, indulgent person because you're pursuing your beauty, joy, and abundance. But I think if that's all you do, that might be right. But I think actually it can feed you to do the difficult work. And then also, as David Wanarovich said, you can't lose sight of your goals. And you do see people who become kind of bitter. It's as though they've stared at the enemy so long they can't see anything else and they kind of forget what they're there for. It is kind of joyless. And it's interesting, there's been a thing in the feminist and activist world that treats anger as a super, as a power. And in Buddhism, anger is one of the three, po or hate, anger or hate, the translations vary as a po one of the three sort of psychic poisons. But also I'm just always like, have you been around angry people? It's like, I have been around a lot, a lot of angry people and I do not like being, like who, as you said, who wants to join a movement of angry people? And, um, but it's also anger narrows your focus. It's a, physiolog and it's a physiological reflex. I think righteous indignation is a, a mindset that doesn't require that, that kind of rageful thing. But it is interesting how validated a lot of negative emotions get, including despair and cynicism which are seen as very sophisticated and worldly and cool. And, and, kind, well, and, kind, well, and kindness is seen yeah. as, a, as a weak quality. Yeah, and hopefulness is also seen as naivete. If you prophesy failure, people will often, you, you see people do this because it's, as a posture, it often makes them feel very sophisticated. And deep. If you posture, if you postulate success, victory, people will often tell you you're naive. And, there's been so many things all the way through the fight to stop the KXL pipeline from the tar sands in Canada um, well into the, into the U.S. and ultimately to refineries sending that, over, that toxic goo overseas. Um, people kept saying we would lose and nobody really stepped forward and was like, well, actually you won. And people don't usually, you get reprimanded in the very moment if you say we could win this. I, I believe that we can win. But people who say we're going to lose it's so normalized, but it's so destructive. And there are definitely things that are foolish that we're not going to win. You know, you're not necessarily going to run a Democrat for Senator. Well, actually we did win a Democrat for Senator in Alabama. And if all the black people in Alabama had full and equal voting rights, Alabama would probably have two Democratic senators, who knows? There are, th there are things that are foolish and there is foolish hope, but as Roshi Joan Halifax says, there's wise hope, but it is interesting how much these hopefulness, kindness, joy are seen as childish or feminine. And so there's also a kind of gender politics of these emotional qualities. Who wants to be cool? And I am wearing all black here, but I was an ex-punk, but. I, I nearly, I nearly. Yeah, uh, you have yeah. Joy Division on. Joy like, Division, yeah. I mean, you know. Which the most ironic, well, our uh, Joy uh, Division, which was not the most joyful band. <laughs> but. We're making up for it. Um, <laughs> Nearly in closing, I love the, the title as you communicated it to me of your, your next book. Um, if I have it right, in praise of the indirect, the slow, the subtle, the imperfect, the unpredictable. That's going to be the introductory essay. Those are things I celebrate over and over because I see them as vital to understanding the world and doing the work. And I enjoy them immensely. And it's been kind of my form of resistance against this kind of linear, direct narrative. And act in, the, in the political world, in the activist world, indirect consequences are incredibly exciting to me. And for example, 
Standing Rock was in part a movement to stop a pipeline that was not actually stopped, although it may yet be. But it, it galvanized the indigenous world of North America. It created all these relationships. Uh, a, young, um, a young woman recently out of college nobody had ever heard of came to Standing Rock um, with her friends in a station wagon from New York and was so galvanized by what she saw there, she went back to New York. Um, you would have never heard of her then. Um, she ran for office, defeated the third most powerful Democrat in the House, and her name is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and, and she introduced the Green New Deal in the House while Ed Markey introduced it in the Senate, and the Green New Deal didn't actually pass either, but it became a template for Biden's climate plan and for the IRA that actually did pass last August, but also a template for other nations, for states, for um, a lot of places, and it changed the story of what was possible. It broke the story that jobs of jobs versus the environment to tell a much more united story. So yeah, I find all those qualities, those subtle, subtle and indirect and roundabout and slow things, um, powerful for understanding the world and powerful for trying to make it better. And that might be. In, I have a question for you, which isn't mine. Um, so I, I asked Bill McKibben if he might have a question to pose to you. Oh, good heavens. And he said, oh, ah, our greatest essayist. I'd ask her, Paul. And here's his question. <laughs> You've worked a lot with young people, and now you're helping out at Third Act, which organizes people over 60 for action on climate and democracy. Are there some strengths older people in particular can bring to bear? Perhaps a perspective of seeing positive change over the long run, even amidst the dips and valleys. I think Bill sort of answered his question. There's something I call a historical imagination, which I think you can actually have if you're very young, or fail to have even if you've lived through all that history. Older people have been given a chance to see the world change radically, but they don't always remember that feminism has been revolutionary in our time, that the world, you know, if you're, and it's funny, Bill put me on the advisory board of Third Act when I was only 59, and I was like, I don't quite get this group and why I'm here, and then I turned 60, and, but it isn't, <laughs> but, and it was, a, part of why he founded it is that he was always being like, young people are wonderful, you do all the heavy work on climate, yeah. and that's so unfair, uh, that, like, young people have done a great job, I, a lot of middle-aged people have also been working on it, but Bill also recognized that older people, often the kids have grown up, they may have retired or they've secured their financial situation, they're not struggling, they can take risks, they have time and resources to spend, and nobody was organizing them. I did want to quote, quote him earlier when we're talking about loneliness and individualism yeah. and isolation, because Bill is often approached by people who say, what's the most useful thing I can do as an individual, and his answer is always stop being an individual, by which he means join something. So I think that, again, categories are leaky. I'm, white people over 60 do trend very right wing, but not all of us. At, um, and, you know, and we're finding the ones who aren't. And so, but I do think that older people have the resources of long memory, the resources of being free from a lot of the anxieties, as he likes to say. A word that isn't used much now, and in fashion, the idea of wisdom. I remember when speaking with Terry. No, I remember when Terry, speaking. Terry to, has it, absolutely. Very much, yeah. and Terry was making a difference between the elderly and the elders. Yeah. Which seems to me yeah. an, a very important way of making that distinction, and a line that keeps coming to my mind is the question Jonas Salk asked, which was, are we good ancestors? 
I also find a lot of wisdom among young people, and I'm often riveted to meet people who didn't even have to free themselves from the shackles my generation grew up with around who we're supposed to be, who we can be. And so there's another kind of wisdom. Off, you know, I find wisdom, again, categories are leaky. I find quite a bit among the young. I meet plenty of foolish older people. And so I'm resistant to framing this generationally. And again, I find young people who have a deep understanding of the radical change of the last half century or more, and older people who forget that, um, you know, how much, you know, and often those older people are putting down young people. Why didn't you buy a house when you were 27? Well, it's like, you know, 50 years ago, but you buying a, buying a house was like twice the normal person's annual income. Now it's 10 times or more. So, you know, so I find, I find wisdom and foolishness everywhere. Thank you very much. <laughs>